Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Sometimes the topic that we're engaging is very important, and today it is. We're going to be talking about ADHD. But other times, topics also include the privilege of talking with dear friends whom I've not been able to be with in a long time. And so this just happens to be a very important topic, but also just a delightful friend. So Dr. Pam Davis, who's the Director of Counseling at Gordon-Conwell, Uh, seminary in Charlotte. So, Pam, we have known one another for many decades. 20 years this year. Oh, my gosh. That is so sweet. I think our first uh, conversation, of course, was in Chiang Mai, where you were a missionary for, let's just say, a few decades. 25? 25 years. And we won't go into all the details of that. But there is a moment I want to bring back to your memory. And that is uh, you and Becky were sitting on a couch and we were watching Monk. Actually, a lot of <laughs> a lot of like three or four episodes. And the two of you started laughing and I was watching Monk and not really paying attention to what you two were giggling about. But somehow, eventually, I began to have a sense that my wife kept pointing at me and you were talking about certain symptoms that were showing up in a constellation that eventually came to be a conversation about hyperfocus ADHD. Mm. And that was the first possible encounter I had uh, with, could this diagnosis be another category that would fit me. Do you remember enough of that moment? Uh, to? You know, I, I don't really remember the incident, but it sounds just like me. <laughs> I think I remember <laughs> um, watching Monk together in a few different countries, actually, that we've been yeah, in together. Yeah, actually, quite um, a, I don't know why we... Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, but yes, I do. I do recall multiple times when we've been able to speak into each other's lives in therapeutic ways. And so I don't remember this, but uh, it feels honoring to hear you name it as the first time you had considered that maybe ADHD fit for you. Well, let, let's just say between between the two of you, it was um, both very playful, but also mm-hmm. really serious. Um, and that you were, Becky was being able to name with uh, a, a deeply gifted professional, but deep friend, things about me that I was, of course, very dismissive, uh, mm. thought it was a ridiculous. But the more we talked, the more there was a connection with um, there is something here to be to be framed. So what I want for folks to be able to engage is what is ADHD and uh, how is it uh, that it is showing up or has been there for a lot of adults and how important is it to be able to know enough about it to be able to understand how people with this unique configuration of both relational, personal, but also neurological structure can be in many ways, both very gifting, but also sometimes very difficult to be engaged with. And Rachel, you were saying before we jumped on uh, about some of your friendships. Yeah, I just, I'm, uh, it's something I've, it's kind of come into the atmosphere more explicitly with people I either a follow online and I'm learning from or f- close friends who have had recent diagnoses of ADHD, like in their forties and fifties and kind of revolutionizing one, the way that they've understood themselves for so many years. And on- honestly, a lot of places of shame and confusion around these are like really high functioning gifted, public facing people, pastoral people, therapeutic people. And so in some ways, like, probably had to power through. But I've just been aware that it's it's being diagnosed more readily. And it's it's really helping people I love. 
Um, and it's something I've been paying more attention to even in myself and kind of just holding open curiosity. Um, is this something, you know, I need to explore more. So it's a really vulnerable thing to say, but I just think anytime something's just becoming more clear and more clarified. So jump us in, Pam, help us come to understand this. Sure. Let's start with just briefly, what is ADHD? And I'd love to speak to, to this idea that it's being diagnosed more. ADHD, first of all, is neurodevelopmental. So people don't develop it in their 40s or 50s, but it is so often diagnosed for the first time, even at age 25 or 30, 40 or 50. Um, but it's you're born with it, right? Neurodevelopmental means you're born with it, which also means it's not a choice. It's not a behavioral choice. It also means it's not due to parenting, right? Some of these things that sometimes we can uh, carry a lot of shame about of, I could do better about this than I'm doing. It's not due to a lack of discipline. Uh, but when I think of ADHD, and I do think the symptoms shift from childhood to adulthood, but when I think of ADHD, I think of the broad categories of focus and that can either be hyper focus or hypo focus where I can't focus on anything. I'm easily distracted, right? Um, so this idea of focus, whether it's under focus or over focus, impulsivity and hyperactivity. And so those three categories are the large markers of ADHD. But what we see shifts from childhood to adulthood is hyperactivity almost always reduces. So you don't see the same hyperactivity uh, in adults as you do in children, but impulsivity and emotional dysregulation, like the shifting moods, easily you know sensitive to criticism, those things stay stable across the lifespan. Oh, I just, uh, I'm, I'm so curious, Rachel, what you're beginning to think about as you hear the, <laughs> those phrases, because like, it, you know, I, I know somebody uh, on this podcast is being indicted, and I, w I hope it's someone other than me. I, I, I'm just grateful. It's just the framing is really helpful, again, because when something yeah. has been so stigmatized, and it's only been portrayed as one thing, for me as a very detail oriented person, a much more anxious person, hyper-focused and, and able to accomplish things. But the impulsivity is when I've always been like, oh, I'm not impulsive. Like I don't, I'm not one to take risks, but my impulsivity for sure comes out in mood and sensitivity to criticism right. and sensitivity to stress. And so it's been a really interesting season. And I'm like scared to talk about this on the podcast because I'm like, I don't want people to think I'm like going into rages with my baby because I'm not. But the impulsivity that I have in this postpartum season, I have a 14 month old, um, has caused me to reckon with ways I am wired differently than any other season of my life. So it's lots of curiosity, but I've never heard it framed that way. That it can be like the emotional dysregulation is part of the impulsivity as opposed to like, taking risks or, you know, risky behavior or different things like that. So, which I know they're linked, but <laughs> I'm risk averse. I'm risk averse. So Yes. Yeah. And I think that's why sometimes the diagnosis is missed in childhood sometimes, right? So if we, if we talk about diagnosis, usually we say this has to be diagnosed before age 12. In other words, people don't develop it at age 30 or 40. I should probably reframe that to say it doesn't have to be diagnosed before age 12, but the symptoms needed to be present before age 12. But a lot of times we miss it. We miss the symptomology. Like if uh, the child is really highly intellectual, smart, reads well, speaks well, we can miss the, uh, we can miss it. And, and instead, they will get uh, diagnosed with things like OCD. They will get diagnosed with behavioral problems, you know, and things. And you can miss the ADHD in those children. But then later, as they learn more about it, maybe they're reading, maybe they're listening to a podcast and they say, wow, these categories fit me. Well, when, when you talk about impulsivity, I, you know, I, I know that uh, that would have been true between the ages of zero and maybe 
40, 50, maybe knit tomorrow. <laughs> but it's an important phrase to say people who are high risk takers often look impulsive or feel impulsive, but it, you're, you're talking about, again, some means by which we're metabolizing different brain processes. What, what, what would you put words to as to what's happening in the brain of a, a, a child or adult with struggles with attention, be it either too little meaning scattered or too much, meaning hyper-focused. What's happening with the interplay of all that? Yeah. And so it's a good question because uh, ADHD is one of the most treatable neuropsychiatric disorders that we come across, uh, but sometimes it's missed. And what's happening in the brain is two neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine, that are missing or lower than the average person. And so that's why sometimes the the first line of medication is a stimulant medication, which immediately increases the dopamine or norepinephrine or some sort of different, uh, some sort of combination of these. There's also really good non-stimulant medications and sometimes the interaction between the two. Um, but what they've discovered is that if you can raise the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, then a lot of times, particularly the impulsivity and the focus uh, dysregulations can really be helped as well as the mood, the mood lability can, can really be different. But I do want to say this uh, in, in saying that I, I want to say this because I think that it is a misconception about all of this, which is I don't think medication is enough. So there is sometimes this, um, you, sometimes you hear this perspective that I just said, which is this is really highly treatable. And then the second half of that phrase is, so just get on medication. But I want to be clear that I don't think medication is enough. Medication is an important component for ADHD, probably more than some of the other disorders. But I don't think it's only medication. I think there's other things that we also have to do, psychosocial things, therapy, um, uh, strategies, like literally just learning strategies, you know. Uh, so, I, yeah. Well, I, I remember on the couch as the conversation didn't remain, shall we say, a singular 30 to 40 minute that didn't have continuation. But even in that process, uh, we were in your home for, I think, a week before we traveled together. And mm -hmm. in that process, kind of the next day or the day after, Becky was beginning to look at me in different ways. And she was able to articulate like it, so many of the things I just am irritated with, so frustrated with how he's like, he can sit in a chair and not move for six to eight hours and read a book forever. And like, doesn't want to eat? Doesn't he have to drink? Doesn't he have to go to the bathroom? How is it possible he can do these kinds of things that feel so weird or irritating. And there was a beginning of a shift. And I think that's one of the gifts of, of being able to not label and diagnose, but to have a sense of what are the parameters that begin to be? Uh, we've used this phrase in the podcast many times. There's something very broken about us, but there's also something very beautiful about that. And I think that conversation that we began decades ago, um, has evolved. You know, I've never had a official diagnosis. I cannot say without question that that would be true of me, but it has helped me frame, it's helped Becky frame some of the behaviors as simple as, why can't you seem to put your keys back in the one drawer we have both agreed upon will be the place where they're kept? And I'm much better certainly than I was 20 years ago. But there are still issues of uh, disordered, more chaotic, but at times also very creative ways of thinking about the world. So as you hear that phrase, broken and beautiful, where does that take you, Pam? 
Right. Well, I think I want to connect that to what Rachel said too a minute ago um, about how she's noticing impact on her relationships, right? Because that phrase broken and beautiful feels a lot like our relationships too, broken and beautiful. And I think that as I consider ADHD and the ways that it can show up in our relationships, um, I think what you've articulated, Dan, is really common in people in relationships where there is a spouse who doesn't understand or who doesn't see it that way. And so sometimes you can hear, you're not listening to me. I, you know, I feel like I say things over and over and, or I feel like you can get done what you want to get done, but you don't get done what I need you to get done. Right. And in these ways, this feels broken, but then there is a shift that occurs. There is a shift that occurs in relationships when two partners can come together and see their brokenness as uh, something unique. And actually, there's there's a good side to ADHD. There's an upside, right? There's uh, maybe you can get a lot done in a short time with that hyper focus, right? Uh, so there 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 are things, and as partners can come together, as friends can come together and recognize um, that, again, this isn't a lack of discipline, right? This isn't uh, your behavioral choice. You were born this way. And uh, while you might need to learn some strategies, you know, uh, Dan, you might need to learn. Let me set a timer every hour so that I turn and speak to my wife, <laughs> right? You might need to learn some strategies. And Timers is a great one. Using calendars and calendar apps is a great one for people who are feeling disorganized and forgetful. Um, and then that creates the beauty, the beauty of redemption in that relationship. Could you speak, Pam, to, because I find myself even questioning like, okay, we know all these ways that, so I, what I hear you saying is ADHD is something you're born with. Um, we also know that trauma and the impact of trauma can disorder and disrupt the brain and bring about really similar symptomology. Mm -hmm. So if someone's trying to discern, is it trauma? Is it ADHD? Um, is it both? Like, how would someone go about and maybe maybe like part of the question is like, what steps would someone take? Mm -hmm. If they're questioning, you know, does this fit me? And because obviously, you could go take like a test online, but may not be as helpful as like, talking to a care provider. Yeah. So what does yeah. that look like? And how do you begin to discern the differences between trauma, ADHD, where they're connected? Right. I, I'm so glad you asked this question because I, I can never talk about ADHD without talking about trauma and talking about the ways that the symptoms overlap. In fact, you know, they are so overlapping that uh, you, you'll often even see them written as Venn diagrams, right? Here's trauma symptoms, here's ADHD symptoms, and oh, there's this whole list in the middle of disorganization, hyperactivity, uh, difficulty sleeping, restlessness, easily distracted, that are also trauma symptoms, right? And so, uh, and I think I want to say this too, particularly in children. Now, y'all know I can't do a podcast without talking about kids, right? In some way. So even <laughs> though we're really focusing today on adult ADHD, I want to bring this in that particularly in children, because we don't have a good trauma diagnosis for children. Um, we, we need, we need that complex developmental trauma or what was originally touted as developmental trauma disorder, meaning a child has grown up in their developmental years in a traumatic situation that recurs, whether that's poverty, whether that's racism, whether that's abuse. These are the types of what I would love to call, it's not in the DSM, but I would love to call it uh, developmental trauma disorder, right? Mm -hmm. And what we see particularly for those kids because we don't have that kind of diagnosis, we see a litany of diagnoses. Oh, this is an ADHD, oppositional defiant, OCD, anxiety, autistic, right? We see, and every time I sit with a family or consult with a school or meet with a supervisee and they say, yeah, this child has these seven diagnoses, you know, I immediately say, 
yeah, I think that's, we need to look at complex trauma because we don't have the diagnosis for that. So we just throw all these other diagnoses. Um, however, I want to say this, what are the differences then? How do we tease that out? And to me, there are a couple of uh, ways that we can do that. One is thinking about symptom onset. So were they born with this? Do we notice these symptoms? Like, do, do you sit with the person and they say, oh, I remember, yeah, in third grade, I couldn't really pay attention and I always lost my homework and I was always getting in trouble for, right? Um, so symptom onset, whereas now, again, sometimes with children, if they're growing up in, a, in an environment of complex trauma, we could miss that too. Uh, but if someone says, no, I really like a lot of this started for me in my twenties after this traumatic event. So that feels to me like a pretty important, uh, differentiation. The other one is whether or not which medication helps. Um, and so if, if you have a trauma diagnosis and you take stimulant medication and you don't have ADHD, those symptoms don't reduce at all. So these symptoms of distraction and disorganization and hyperactivity and restlessness that we get sometimes in a trauma diagnosis, the ADHD medications won't touch those symptoms if you don't need them. It's one of the things I like to say to parents, actually, when I'm working with them, and they're a little bit hesitant to you, to put their child on medication, right? Like they think, oh, I don't want my kid to be on medication the rest of their life. I, I don't know if I want to start this. I say, here's the thing, try it. And if it, if it doesn't work, and ADHD medicine works the first day you take it. So yeah. it, if it doesn't work, then you know that we're not looking at ADHD. So to me, those two things, symptom onset and the efficacy of the medication really help us know. One more thing, though, that I would say is sometimes I don't think diagnosis matters. It doesn't matter. Like, um, um, I, I like to say this a lot to my students and supervisees. Diagnosis is only as important as informing treatment. So if, if we have a big question of, is this trauma or is this ADHD? Let's treat, let's start by treating those symptoms, getting the story, hearing some of those things and, and going from there. And then if we think that working through trauma isn't really helping some of those symptoms, then you might look at ADHD symptoms too. That's really helpful. Thank you. What do you know? What do you know either the research or just anecdotally of the interaction effect? Meaning let's assume, and I'm speaking obviously of myself, that um, we have photos of uh, my mother having roped me uh, to the garage door because at age two, uh, and this is how I would put it, I, I had enough sense to escape. Um, it was a crazy world to be in. And so at age two, I'm running away. And the only way she could right. figure out to keep me from escaping is just time to the garage door and he can't escape. So there's trauma. Trauma comes <laughs> even more intensified eventually with the death of my father and a great deal of developmental, uh, certainly in terms of traumatic experiences, much abuse later, et cetera. But I'm assuming from the data that I have collected that indeed the ADHD was a, a present. Is there a kind of interaction effect where ADHD interacting with trauma in one sense increases the trauma, but may increase as well some of the symptomology of ADHD? Right. I definitely think we can say that it increases the symptoms. So it's not, it's not causation right? Like it's not that uh, ADHD causes trauma or trauma causes ADHD. I don't think so because again, ADHD is neurodevelopmental. You're born with it. Um, even if you don't develop symptoms till a little later, but can having, uh, can being exposed to childhood trauma trigger those symptoms? 
Absolutely, right? Because they are overlapping symptoms. So a child who is exposed uh, to trauma or some of these things, Dan, that you're talking about, would they develop hyperfocus? Absolutely, right? Um, now to say, well, was that part of their ADHD or part of their trauma? That's where I want to go back to. I don't think that matters. Like, I don't think exactly. it really matters uh, what it was, what caused it. Though I agree totally with what you're saying. The dilemma is that when you have some degree of dysregulation, irrespective of causation, um, our school systems, our churches, uh, often our families uh, are not well prepared to address. And therefore, oftentimes, the symptom cluster creates enough complexity that the response of the world, parents, church, school, is to engage in a way that actually does create more trauma. Would that be something that you would concur with or differ? Yes, I I actually haven't thought of it in those terms, um, but I think I would agree with this because, again, so often the um, we think of children, ADHD children with ADHD, as that this is behavior they choose, they can control it, right? Uh, all of these things, and what we've discovered, you know in the last 20 years is that actually these things even occur in utero. So, um, you know, wow. that they're, wow. yeah, that children can have, can develop the neurodevelopmental deficiencies of the dopamine and the norepinephrine in utero because of the way the mother is experiencing her pregnancy. Right. So mothers who really want a child, who are have a lot of social support, they those those individuals have less chance of having a child who's born with ADHD. And but we don't see it till age five or six. So we don't see the mm. symptoms start till age five or six. But it was actually maybe came from this unwanted pregnancy that and I feel alone in the world. And I was sad through most of my pregnancy, which created the neurodevelopmental uh, deficiency. And yet I want to say this because I don't want people to feel guilty. And there's a lot of shame in ADHD. Uh, there's a lot of shame in ADHD. In fact, I think that's why we end up with so many ADHD adults who are perfectionists, and which doesn't seem to make sense to us. Right? Like, we're like, wait a minute. If, if people with ADHD are forgetful and lose the details, then how in the world? And it's, but it's actually true that so many people, uh, who are diagnosed with ADHD are also perfectionists. Why? And Rachel, mm -hmm. you hit on this a minute ago. It's because of the shame. It's because of the shame and shame causes us to say, shame causes that individual to say, I've got to prove to these people I can do it right. I'm such a failure. I don't want to be a failure. This time I know I, this time I know I'm going to do it right. This time I'm going to keep this job. I'm not going to bounce from job to job. I'm going to keep this job because I'm going to keep my relationships. I'm going to show up on time. Right. And so they become a perfectionist, but then the cycle just continues and they fail again because they don't have the social support. They aren't implementing the strategies and sometimes they don't want to take medication. Understand. I understand that war. I have a lot of compassion for that war. Yeah. And, and, and what do you see in terms of the role or the place of creativity and ADHD? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Well, you know, I am a play therapist by trade. And so I love to incorporate play. And they, there is a lot of uh, understanding now that the importance of play or creativity, art, making mandalas, right? These kinds of things can actually have a really calming effect on the nervous system, uh, which is often overactivated in a person with ADHD. They don't know why, but they feel anxious, right? The comorbidity of anxiety and depression with someone with ADHD. And it makes sense because they've lived their lives. Many people with ADHD live very chaotic lives, 
always trying to catch up to the next thing, always trying to uh, get out of their financial struggle, to reduce the stress in their lives, but they can't quite get there. So the role of creativity, the role of getting onto a kayak, the role of uh, painting, watercolor, the role of of spending time doing something that allows you to access that creative part of your brain automatically increases dopamine. Well, and it, as you think about then your work, particularly with children, play therapy, Santre, what, what would you say would be some of the characteristics that are, are, are somewhat unique for children and for adults with ADHD? Do you mean in, can you clarify that? Do you mean like in therapy approaches? Yeah, or how, how, how you experience people's creativity who seem to have um, the, the dimension of ADHD? Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, I will be honest with you that in counseling, I don't experience clients, children or adults with ADHD vastly differently uh, than other clients or other. And this is because so many of the symptoms overlap, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that I would be able to draw a firm any kind of firm correlation between creativity and ADHD. But what we do know is that uh, many times uh, people with ADHD actually have high intelligence, high creativity, but they're held back sometimes by, by these structures of, I, I forget things, I lose things, I'm not on time, um, and so on. Well, it, 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 let me test and see it, how both of you respond to this. I, I know a number of pastors um, who I think either by their own self-proclamation or, or the data being sufficient have unique um, configurations of ADHD. And some of their sermons are some of the most compelling uh, I've heard because they're surprising. Uh, they're they're not people who function in a kind of expected logical process. It's sort of like a part of their brain is scrambled, but it's not just chaotic. It's intriguing. It opens up ways of thinking I wouldn't think easily when I approach a passage and hear it being taught. I have to admit, most of the time when I hear the beginning, you know, read in the bulletin what's going to be preached, I'm thinking about, well, what would I say? And then several of the pastors I'm thinking about that I get the privilege of being around, um, like how they bring, you know, fine, strong, beautiful, exegetical and hermeneutical skills, and yet how they organize and bring it to uh, uh, very surprising. So I, I find um, people with that, shall we say, peculiarity, um, sometimes surprising in lovely and intriguing ways. <laughs> Honestly, I'm just sitting over here like, do I have ADHD? So that's the look on my face. Mm -hmm. I'm like pondering what you're talking about, Dan. And I am thinking about my very right brain approach to most public speaking, which is funny because I would have, I often think of myself as a very left brain communicator, right? Because you just that the way we so think insane. about these, it's these... Just, it's just, if there's any benefit to this, it, this conversation is like, but... Rachel, what is wrong? But, but it's the, it's the nature, like, it's how we think about these things. It's how we talk about like public speaking and preaching and teaching and how we conceptualize like the way people would bring these things. So it's just, I've always thought of myself as like, yeah, I'm very linear. I'm very organized. I'm, you know, cause I'm, I am a little bit type A. I am a perfectionist. So when you said to me a couple weeks ago, Dan, that I was a right brained public speaker who needed to establish more left brain anchors for the left brain thinkers in the room, that was revolutionary for me. So I'm just, I, I'm mostly just really taking in this conversation. And I, what I appreciate is, um, 
I don't, I did not know before this conversation that ADHD was um, neurodevelopmental. And that is such a helpful category. Um, it also brings me like just feeling a lot of compassion. Yes. I think that's where my brain is going as I'm thinking back through many iterations of my childhood and just and, and looking with a new lens, more out of curiosity and exploration than like anything substantial. But it just helps me have a lot of compassion for people who have been having to navigate a world that requires a certain way of being um, who have had like when you just think about it as biochemical deficiencies that result in a different wiring and processing of the brain. Um, it just, it kind of makes me angry and it makes me feel a lot of compassion. Yeah. And I mean, probably starting with myself, although yeah, I have a lot of questions around like, is it trauma? Um, is it something else? I'll have to go explore a little bit, but, um, that's where I'm like, Dan, if you, cause everyone can't see my face, but I'm just aware that I'm kind of like, I didn't know that. So this is really helpful. And I'm hoping that it's helpful for others who either a, you know, ex encountered something like ADHD when they were, you know, 20 years ago when, yeah, I think we had a very different understanding of what it was and how to treat it. So I still have questions for someone like if they were to say, okay, I, I want to explore this more. Are they reaching out to a therapist? Is there a certain kind of therapist they need to reach mm -hmm. out to? Are they seeing a medical doctor? You know, D, all of the above. Yes, <laughs> like, all of that. You know, what's, one of the, what's the next steps? <laughs> right. One of the things I think that I've been so encouraged in uh, recently when talking about ADHD is that it does seem like there is a much more lifespan perspective about ADHD than there used to be previously. I think this speaks to, uh, Rachel, you mentioned earlier uh, that you notice a lot more people in the 40s and 50s are being diagnosed and curious about that. I think it's, be and I think it's largely helpful because up until now, it seems like there has been a bifurcation that ADHD is a childhood disease or it's an adult yes. disease, but we haven't had right. this bridge that this is something you live with all your life. So surround yourself, first of all, with people who understand you having others, you know, meeting with people, having an ADHD tribe, if you will, uh, can be really helpful to say, yes, this is something we live with across our lifespan, that community and social support. Um, Finding a job that works for you can also be really helpful. Like if you, and we do that, we find that people with ADHD can be very successful and stay in one job because they find a job that lets them shift a lot, move a lot, change a lot. Um, that also is so important. And some of the things are really things like strategies. You know, we talked about those already, making lists, using timers. I think all of these things contribute to this lifespan perspective rather than saying it's something you're going to outgrow, which I don't know if you guys have heard that, but there used to be this old wisdom that you would outgrow ADHD. And it's actually a misnomer. What really happens is you learn to manage your symptoms. Uh, you learn strategies, you marry somebody who helps keep you organized, right? All of these kinds <laughs> of things uh, that it seems like you outgrow. And in fact, a lot of the studies will say that about one in seven or eight report that they outgrew their ADHD. But two points about that is that often it's that they've learned to manage symptoms and you still have six or seven out of eight that have not yeah. that report that they've not outgrown their ADHD. So I love your construct of compassion, Rachel, because I hope that that's what's happening more in this lifespan perspective of ADHD, more in this understanding that you're born with it. And if you're not diagnosed till your fifties, um, I'm so glad you're diagnosed now, but you might, you've probably experienced uh, a lot of harm and a lot of hurt that maybe you didn't have to because people mm -hmm. people labeled you as lazy, not listening, mm -hmm. disorganized, 
Why don't you try harder? And I'm grateful to hear that there is more openness to understanding a new category. Mm -hmm. well, Pam, before we end, a person hearing goes, okay, uh, there are some of the symptom structures that seem to fit. I love the fact that you've, in one sense, said the, the Venn diagram between traumatic histories and ADHD is so overlapping that at one level, it, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're tending to the symptoms, caring for the process in a way that bears kindness and compassion and that you're in a community that does not um, demean you, therefore create even more dysregulation. So with that said, um, what would be the next steps for a person who says, I'd like to do a little bit more. I'd like to do a little bit more to yeah. see what's going on for me. Yeah, well, I would start with a therapist, start there and to see if, uh, to hear a little bit of, I'm not sure what this is, but I listened to this great podcast and this is what I came out with, right? So, um, yeah, I think you could start there with just talking through the structures. I think many, many therapists will say, well, why don't you see your psychiatrist or a doctor to see about which medication works for you? Um, and to see, and again, understanding which medication works can really, really help you tease out what's what. But I still say, even with that, there are times when the symptoms overlap and you can't tease out, is this hyper-focus due to trauma or is it due to ADHD? So after seeing a therapist, seeing your doctor, I would also say, find a community um, and if there's not one around you, build one because all it takes is a few conversation and you suddenly know four people and build, <laughs> right? <laughs> like we we're talking about yeah. that even today, build a community of, can we get together and talk about this? And what particularly, what strategies work for you? Um, what, what do you need to do to help manage your symptoms? Mary Becky Allender. <laughs> And your point being the ability to be in uh, tender, caring, but honest relationships. Uh, again, I go back to the couch uh, and the conversation that the two of you playfully, but very seriously had awakened um, an awareness, uh, certainly reading and thinking. And I think even though it's never a finished work, um, a growing sense of this is heartbreaking. And I, I can see all sorts of complications for my life. Um, and probably the one that was most significant was going, I've always thought of myself as stupid. Um, just I, I, I did not do well in school. You know, I graduated uh, with an acume that in the state of Ohio was illegal to, to graduate with isn't that enough of an indication? I'm not smart. Um, I'm kind of street smart, but I'm not smart. And so the degrees post, um, it, it, we, we know that experiences in life do not eradicate the effects of trauma. You have to engage trauma. You have to engage the reality of ADHD to begin to go, where has this left me? What judgments? What accusations? And we've addressed this at least a bit. What shame uh, remains? But in that process of exposure, um, there are so many things that uh, I would say immediately I would go, oh, there are five or six things we do. Becky and I, I do with Becky that are part of the regulation to keep some of the symptomology from being uh, more um, divisive. So your invitation is to kindness, uh, not, not mere knowledge, but to kindness, but also to an intentionality of there is good that this has brought and likely this is harm you have had to endure Let's do the work to engage it. And for that end, oh, Pam, again, 
uh, we would love to have you on several hundred more times. Particularly, I want at some point to do a conversation about Santre. But for the moment, oh, I would love to simply just say thank you so much for being with us. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. This was fun. We invite you to check out Effective Trauma Care, now available as a self-paced online course from the Allender Center. This popular two-day training by Dr. Dan Allender was filmed in 2023 and organized into eight teaching modules to help you work through the content at your own pace. The Effective Trauma Care online course is designed to help you cultivate a deeper understanding of the impact of trauma and abuse, while also equipping you with the tools to engage past trauma effectively. This online course is designed for therapists, practitioners, ministry leaders, and advocates desiring a deeper understanding of the impact of trauma and abuse and a stronger grasp of the tools to engage individuals with courage and care. Enroll today at theallendercenter.org slash online dash courses. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.